All right, well, good evening, everyone. It's great to see you guys here. Thank you so much if you're visiting with us. It's great to have you guys here. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Tyson. This is my lovely little wife, Chloe, who will come up and uh, just so that I can introduce both of us. Uh, so we are Tyson and Chloe. We meet the Canterbury Church of Christ down here. Uh, it is, uh, we've been married for seven years. Mm -hmm. um, so we are by no means the most senior people in this room. We have one daughter. She is about to turn two years old. Uh, but it, we, we're very excited to be able to be down here, and um, you know, this, she's beautiful and she's lovely. Uh, you know, but, but we're, we're, we actually just celebrated our seventh uh, anniversary a few months back. But uh, awesome. yeah, ten years coming up. But as I said before, we have we have no uh, we we don't actually have all of the information. I hear that you get that around your ten. Is that correct? Twelve. Twelve. Okay, got you. So I, I wanted to ask. Who here has been married for 15 years or more? 15 years or more? Yes. Wow. Uh, two? Yes. No? <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, yes. so all yes. keep your hands up. Who's been married for 20 years or more? Wow. Uh, all right, 30 years or more? Yeah. All right, Mama oh. John, Mama John. All right, 15 years. 57 years. Wow. Wow, 57. All right. Well, there you go. They will be doing the lesson, so guys, come on up. <laughs> no, but uh, even though, you know, 57 years, that is a long time to be married, but the reality is that no one in here has all of the answers to marriage. Yeah. No one in here knows everything that they're doing. We all still make mistakes, and thank goodness for that, because the reality is that I certainly don't know everything, but... You're not hearing it just for me, it's me tonight. Mm -hmm. So tonight we're going to be looking at the Word of God and figure out what it has to tell us because ultimately we don't have to learn. We, all that we have to do in order to learn from someone is actually to look to the Word of God mm -hmm. and also to be humble to input from one another. So I have so much that I can learn from you guys and I hope that you guys can take something away from what we talk about tonight. But as followers of Jesus, we have the ultimate source of wisdom, the ultimate source of understanding, and that is the Word of God. So we're going to be actually going over and looking at Philippians chapter 2 today, so you guys can get a little jump start on that. But this is something that is definitely a challenge for me. And if you've been married for any length of time, which you all have, uh, selfless love is something that is difficult no matter how long you have been married. And tonight we're going to look at this idea of selfless love, we're going to talk about the barriers to it, how we can have it, uh, but then also what it looks like in a marriage that is selfless in the way that we love. You know, it's, the definition to selfless love is quite simple, actually. It's the removal of self out of the equation when it comes to love. But this is something that for most of us we don't naturally do. How many of us in here have children? You know, okay, that's everyone? Okay, there you go. All you have to do is look at a kid in order to understand how we are kind of hardwired to think about ourselves. We live in, we, kids are very me-centric, they're very self-focused. Um, and it's nothing wrong with them, that's just the way that we kind of are brought up for the most part. Well, uh, biologically, we're wired to, fit, to kind of take care of ourselves, even if when we're young we are very bad at it. Uh, you know, we have to have our parents looking after us constantly so that we don't choke on things so that we don't eat things that we're not supposed to, so that we don't stick things in power sockets, and all of that nonsense. But kids are also very good at telling you when you aren't doing something that they want you to. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my child is coming, coming into the terrible twos, and so when she doesn't like something, she lets you know very, very vocally. <laughs> but when things are going opposed to our desires, don't we also seem feel the same way? We don't, maybe we don't scream or yell as much or say no as much, but the reality is we live in a world where we are, it's more focused on self-love than selfless love. Am I right? You know, but these behaviors, they're hardwired into our patterns of behavior, uh, you know, and, and unless we actively go against them, then we're bound to these things infect every aspect of our lives, even our marriages. You know, this sort of behavior doesn't lead to the kind of strong, healthy marriages that we desire. So, what's the alternative? What are we, what are, what are we supposed to do instead? So, open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 4. Let's look at that together. But before we get started, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll read God's Word. 
Father God, thank you so much for this time to be able to come together and, and just talk about marriage, God. It's an amazing, amazing gift that you have given us, God. Uh, I know that I have gotten to know you better. I've gotten to know myself better as a result of the wife that you've given me. And I know for each man in this room, uh, we, we've all experienced that as well. The blessing that it is to have a wife, God. I know, thank you so much for them, for their hearts, uh, whether it's uh, the, the mothers that they are, the, the, the partners in crime that they are, God. But we are so grateful for them. Pray that you'll please help us to learn about selfless love from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we pick up in verse 1. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to the interest of each one of those, uh, of, of each other. You know, and so this, this is our passage for this evening, but this, this comes right off the back of chapter <coughs> 1. In chapter 1, Paul is talking to the Philippians, they're going through lots of challenges, they're going through lots of hardships, and he's calling them, he's saying, guys, remember to be unified. No matter what's going on around you, no matter what challenges you're going through, you know what, be unified. Fight for unity. And if there's one thing that's true about marriage is no matter how great your marriage is, it's not always sunshine and roses. That's true. You know, in the words of Pat Benatar, love is a battlefield. You know, and so Paul begins with a list of very rhetorical questions. These are just accepted by Paul. He says, guys, look, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any, any comfort from his love, any common sharing of spirit, these are all the predecessors to anything that will come from this idea. The call to unity starts with these things. Mm -hmm. And so if for, if for no other reason than these, we can be unified. We can love selflessly. But he starts with these attributes of a relationship, but he starts with these things that will inhibit loving selflessly. Mm -hmm. You know, selfish ambition and vain conceit, those are the two things that he lists there. You know, selfish ambition, it's a, it's a mentality that's concerned first and foremost about it, kind of pushing forward one's own agenda. You know, getting, advancing one's own aims, it's strategic, it's manipulative, it's cunning. It's all about, okay, you know what? The, the original word and the language kind of has this idea of kind of politics, kind of like a politician pushing forward their agenda. It's like a politician out on a campaign trail. You know, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to get their goals met, they're trying to do, they do nice things for people, but it's all for a certain, you know, behind the scenes goal. You know, and so, uh, their ambitions are for the district, for the region. It's all kind of a means to an end. That's this idea of that selfish ambition. Vain conceit, on the other hand, it's focused on self, but its motives are slightly different. You know, its main concern is has to do with making oneself look good, mm -hmm. making oneself feel good. You know, and that's the that's the purpose behind it. Focused on kind of the short term rather than the long term. You know, it's hard. It's it's not hard to see how these mentalities, if they sneak into our relationships, if, if we don't actively fight against them, how much they can affect our marriages. You know, in the past week, I've been, or the past, past couple of weeks, I've been thinking about this lesson, thinking about this passage, and, and I, I've been noticing things in my own life, in my own marriage, in my own kind of parenting as well, and thinking about, okay, man, how much do I focus on myself? How much do I focus on my own needs, my own desires, my own time, energy, whatever. And it's, it's, it's really stuck out to me, man, I think about myself quite a lot in my marriage. You know, my time, after coming home from working throughout the day, I, I, I want my own time. I want to be like, okay, you know, this is my time. I just kind of want to kick back and relax a little bit. Obviously, that's, my, my wife has also been working the whole day. You know, my, my daughter still needs things. And, but that's, in my mind, I think, how can I get what I need. My energy, if you, if you have kids, you understand how valuable sleep is. <laughs> but, but sleeping, I, I, I love sleep. It's great. It feels awesome. But I can't, I can't allow that to rule me. My, my wife needs sleep. I need sleep. But then even in little things, like my stuff, I was walking towards my wife. I had two hands full of M&Ms. And I was in my mind, I was weighing, okay, which one has more? That's the one that I want. <laughs> you know, it, but the reality is that when it comes to these things, if I'm feeling this way about the small stuff, 
If I'm feeling this way about M&Ms, then how much more when things get big, when things get proper challenging, am I going to be thinking about myself? You know, and it was quite convicting as I was studying this out, and, and I was just like, yeah, okay, what's the solution? How do we fix this problem? And Paul's solution to this problem is actually quite simple. It's straightforward. He says, just don't operate this way. Just do the opposite. You know, you start thinking this way, just go the opposite direction. Run as fast as you can in the opposite direction. He says, look, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Because these are the things that actually prevent us from having unity, prevent us from loving selflessly. You know, so Paul's talking about unity. He, this, but what's really crazy is that he's actually not even talking about marriage in this passage specifically. He's talking about unity between the believers, between the brothers and sisters in Christ. If he's feeling this way about them, how much more should we be focusing on this in our marriages? Mm -hmm. One spirit, one mind, love for all disciples. This, is, this has to be what our marriages look like. If this is the call for just your Joe Shino disciple, how much more so for the love of your life? You know, we... We all love a good before and after photo. And nothing quite hits the spot like, you know, a transformation, you know, a renovation. That's why there are so many stinking renovation shows on TV, because everyone loves a good renovation, a good before and after photo. You know, and, and one of the, uh, this one is one that Chloe found. It's very satisfying. This is the before picture. You know, and this guy might actually be the one who renovated it. But this is the after photo. Wow. It's pretty incredible, right? I, I honestly, I like look back like, how on earth did they yeah. get from that to that? I bet you guys could do this with your guys' kids. <laughs> so it just gets my ideas. Aji, you, you get on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but in a lot of ways, this is what my marriage was like before. Not a lot of room for anyone other than myself. You know, I was basically the only one that could fit in there. You know, my time, my energy, my stuff, my own desires. That's what my life was focused on. In the early days of my marriage, I was selfish. But the scriptures call us to a complete remodel of the way that we think. In humility, to consider others better than ourselves, to consider others more important than ourselves. And so then it looks more like this there's a lot more surface area, there's a lot more room for other people other than yourself. There's a lot more space there that you can actually do things with. And it's a, lot, it's a lot prettier as well. You know, it looks a lot better from the outside. But the reality is that this is, this is what it looks like when we remodel our lives, when we remodel ourselves and shape ourselves the way that the Word of God says. You know, now the, the reality is that I have to fight every day to consider Chloe above myself. But it's a good thing. You know, how can I guard her time? How can I, how can I guard her energy so that she can do what she needs? How can I share with her the things that I have? How can I give to her of myself? How can I meet her desires, her wants? Because when I have that sort of a mentality, when both parties in a marriage have that sort of a mentality, and have this selfless outlook, marriages flourish. Marriages grow. Yeah. You know, but, and when I'm looking out for Chloe's interests and she's looking out for mine, then we can trust one another to meet each other's needs. You know, without any fear of, oh, what, what's going what's to come of me? You know, because they're worried about me, I'm worried about them, and so we're working together towards the same end. <coughs> and when there's conflict in a marriage, we can actually trust one another. We can know, okay, man, I know that they love me, I know that they care, and so therefore I can actually trust what they say, that, that they're not trying to hurt me, even when we're having conflict. We can work through it because I know that she's looking out for my best interests and the other way around. When there are needs within a relationship, we can trust one another to take care of it. We can trust one another to be vulnerable. Being vulnerable, and even in a marriage, is challenging sometimes. Telling each other what it is that we need emotionally, physically, you know, spiritually. This is all essential. But we have to have humility in our relationship with one another, and we have to communicate those needs. And when, when anything's out of place, we can trust one another to communicate what those needs are, where we need to be changing, but then also what, what we need from them in order to change as well. But communication, that's one, one of the biggest things in, in marriage that causes conflict. 
his lack of communication. Yeah. Now, if, something that I've learned is that it's almost impossible to over communicate. I have never reached it. If anyone in here has, you can talk to me afterwards. Let's learn from you guys. <laughs> but this is where Paul brings it, brings it all into focus in the after picture that we should all be aiming for. When we pick up in verse 5 then, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Okay, let, let's read that again. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was equal to God in every sense. He had every right to to, 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 to push his agenda, to push his own motives. But in spite of all of this, he denied himself his rights. He denied himself and he loved selflessly. Even at the point where death was the only option, his life was on the line, he gave, he loved those around him. You know, this is the example that Paul calls us to imitate, the example that God ultimately calls us to imitate. I have a question. How different would your marriage look if this was the way that you loved your spouse? You know, what would you, what would change in your day-to-day -day life if this was the way that we loved one another? I'd like to ask Chloe to come up and share some of your thoughts. Don't worry. Come on, Chloe. Come on, Chloe. Um, I was reflecting on this passage, and I think something that definitely over the years that I've been married as well has been important for me to learn is that when considering humility and selflessness together, it's important to know the difference between a true humility and then just conflict avoiding, posing as humility. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you're the conflict avoider type, um, you know, easygoing, um, or if you've got, you know, internalized that belief that expressing yourself or expressing your needs is bad or selfish or then it can be easily misunderstood, like that's what humility is, or, or it's easy to hide behind, oh, I'm just being humble, but actually I'm just trying to get out of this situation. Mm -hmm. So reading this passage called to my mind um, the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount, because if all the women would be reading through that and studying it together, and it really like, made me think of when we looked at um, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And, you know, we've talked about meekness as being willing to lay down your rights, you know, like, not, or, or lay down the fight for your rights. Um, and instead just place yourself in, in God's hands and that that's a really admirable quality and requires so much humility and it's difficult and that is what Paul is echoing in, in this passage. Um, however, there is a difference between being meek and also being dishonest mm. and humility isn't just you know, swallowing your thoughts and feelings in order to avoid the confrontation but instead it's um, fighting through to be like-minded, to be of the same spirit as he refers to in verse 4 there. Um, and having the same love, and it requires knowing what's on each other's minds and hearts. And the process to get to that like-mindedness can take, you know, back and forth in a couple of iterations. Um, it takes conversation, prayer, sometimes a bit of wrestling, it can be uncomfortable, or there's moments of insecurity. Um, and, but that's not bad, it's actually vital for a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. And that process, I mean, it, it has to be done with humility, for sure, that's what Paul is saying. But just swallowing it all down in order to avoid conflict, you know, can lead to like bitterness building up and resentments and that and, and an emotional disconnect between you and your spouse, which isn't good. So I mean, also sometimes you know, um, it's hard to believe, but sometimes your spouse just sometimes does have issues and needs to grow. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the kind of humility that Jesus shows isn't one that enables sinful behavior. You know, he's really high standards and he's honest about um, his expectations and what he wants from people. But he's also so quick to do everything he can to support all of us to be close to God, despite where we're at, including sacrificing himself. And so in the same way, our humility leads us to respect and love our spouse, enough to know when to swallow your pride and be quiet, which is very difficult, um, and also when to swallow your fear and to speak up uh, lovingly, both of those. So all of this is a really high call, and it's so easy to agree in principle when you look at other people's situations. Mm, that's what they need to do. They need to just follow their mind. 
Um, but it's so much more difficult to apply to yourself in the moment um, when you're frustrated or tired or stressed and you know the house is a mess and you're overstimulated, there's noise everywhere. Um, and I think that Paul knows that this is like a superhuman level of selflessness and, and self-denial. And there's no person you can look to as an example for that who does it perfectly other than Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so making it about Jesus gives us the calling and the inspiration to live this out, even in difficult circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, even when we're at our worst, you know, sometimes I wish like verses like this had like a little, you know, parenthesis at the end, unless you're tired, stressed, or <laughs> you know, um, fill in the blank. Um, and, or even when maybe your spouse isn't living this out, you know, like you are both kind of at each other's throats, like they're also being selfish, you're being selfish, or they're struggling in themselves at that moment with their fears or their backgrounds or, you know, whatever might be going on with them, but they might be even antagonizing you. But I just think that call, um, that Jesus' humility wasn't conditional on whether we deserved it or not, it was because he submitted himself to God. And so we have to have the same conviction that this is how we are going to live regardless of how the situation is, what the circumstance, or how someone else might be behaving, or whether they're humbled out first. Mm-hmm. Um, so Paul doesn't um, say, you know, consider others' interests above your own, unless they're being so unreasonable, um, or unless you've had a bad week, then you can just be a bit disunified. It's, it's just so unconditional. Um, but of course, we can't be perfect, like Jesus, um, and we will make mistakes, and so we need to have grace and compassion that it's difficult for us to do that, and got to have that with ourselves and with our spouse as well. The standard is high and it's so important that we fight to keep the standard high with each other, mm-hmm. but there will be moments when we fail, of course, and when we do, like being gracious with each other, being gracious with ourselves, and just reorienting back to humility. Um, it makes the failures you know, smaller and shorter and gets them properly resolved as well. Yeah. And now, so what we're going to do is we'll, we'll go through a couple of the, uh, the before and after pictures. So we've got some scenarios here. Um, So our first scenario is, you know, the four pictures, my spouse needs to communicate with me in the way that I like it or I won't engage. You know, the right time, the right tone, the right moment. Or, you know, uh, in the moment when it's happening. Or maybe not in the moment when it's not happening. Or after I've had my cuppa or not on the weekend. That's kind of the before picture, where where our our communication is so conditioned. But then the after picture. Yeah, just asking, how, how does my spouse appreciate communicating? And you probably know, but if you don't, just ask. <laughs> That's humble as well. Yeah. There we go. Oh, that's a bit um, Yeah, the full picture. What arguments or evidence will get me what I want from this conflict? You know, like, is it um, keeping up that record of wrongs to bring up at just the right moment that's going to help get your <laughs> argument over the line? Or, you know, thinking, how can I play my cards just right that it's going to land in my direction? Um, it's the before renovation picture. Yeah. And then the after the, after the renovation picture is, is less focused on the you and the me and more on the us and the we. You know, that, that's the reality. We, we can't actually get stuck on, okay, it's you versus me, but we're actually working together to try and get unified and to get on the same page. Um, the, one, one of the adages that I, I learned pretty early on in marriage is, if, if you win the argument, the marriage actually loses. Yeah. You know, if, if one person is winning, then the marriage is losing. And so, so just really fighting for unity rather than to win the argument. And then the next one is, is this idea of critical listening. You know, when we're, when we're listening to try and, uh, to try and respond or, or try and uh, create a rebuttal with what they're saying and, and picking, nitpicking everything that they're saying, I've definitely been guilty of this in, in our marriage as well, where it's like, okay, uh, what you said is tech is factually incorrect, and so therefore I don't have to listen to what you're saying. But that's the before picture. <laughs> um, the contrast is listening to hear the heart and hear the point behind what your spouse is saying. Okay, what, what are they trying to communicate? Even if they're saying it perfectly, they're using the wrong words, they can't remember the last three most recent examples, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, guess what comes up with us now. <laughs> um, yeah, but just listening to hear, okay, what's the point that they're really trying to communicate? Yeah. Um, and then the next before picture is, you know, my spouse should just know how I'm feeling. You know, we've been married a while, we've been in this situation before, let me just let them know, you know, I'll give him the cold shoulder, and wait for him to approach me, he needs to make the first move, he needs to know what to do. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the before picture. 
But the after after picture is actually being vulnerable. You know, when when there when there's conflict, when there are problems, we actually have to be the ones to to initiate sometimes. Sometimes the other person doesn't realize. Just a little hint, ladies, guys are kind of thick sometimes. We kind of we need things kind of spelled out for us. This was the problem, this is what you did, this is what you didn't do. But we need some help. You know, that's the reason why God gave us helpers. It's not good for men to be alone because we do crazy things when we're on our own. But <laughs> humility is actually sharing the vulnerable moments with our spouse. The, vo- the vulnerable things that we don't tell the wider populace. But that's, that's, it's really important to do that with one another. You know, and then the other one is uh, coming up in a second. There we go. But she needs to meet my needs. That's the guy. And then the girl is, he needs to meet my needs. You know, this is the before picture. And, and the reality is that as long as, you know, we have physical needs, we have emotional needs, we have spiritual needs, but as long as we keep this sort of before mindset of she needs to meet my needs, he needs to meet my needs, it's always going to be at odds because, you know, typically men have more physical needs, women have more emotional needs. But guys, if you aren't meeting your wife's emotional needs, if you're not fighting to get to know her emotionally, you know, then, then she's going to have a harder time being intimate with you. Because that, that's, they, they don't, they don't, they need that connection. Whereas we, we can just, we're like a, a, a light switch off and on. They, they need more time. You know, but sometimes this looks like having a conversation. You know, without an agenda, but just having a conversation, getting to know our wives. Other times it looks like vacuuming the house or washing the dishes. But we, they, they need this. Our wives need our help. You know, and the after the people. Yeah, I, I know that uh, whenever I am focused on getting my needs met, whatever it might be, all I can focus on what's not being met. <laughs> and so I'm always disappointed or there's always something to feel like it's falling short. So yeah, that after picture of, okay, let me consider, you know, Tyson's interests above my own or someone else's interests above mine. How can I meet their needs? What more can I be doing? It just changes my focus from what do I feel like I'm not getting and get, you know, kind of frustrated about that to what more can I do? And I just find that so much more refreshing as well. Like I see the wisdom that Paul has and guiding us to that mindset. So, yeah. And that kind of leads us to this one as well. What's the bare minimum that I can keep, I can, I can do to keep it ticking along? Just kind of doing that bare minimum to so that no one can talk to me about anything, so that no one can bring anything up because I'm doing the things, you know. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing all of my responsibilities. But in the afternoon. Yeah. Says it all. What more can I do? <laughs> I think um, speaking for women generally, I know that it's. I really appreciate it when Tyson takes initiative to ask himself. You know, you know, what more can I do? Let me just look around and see what needs to be done. Chloe's like overwhelmed and trying to do a million things. Let me just take care of this and this without me needing to project manage it in my mind. And that always really encourages me that he's um, thought of that without me needing to even communicate that. I think one thing that she's actually talked to me about is this idea of the mental, the mental load that uh, that wives often take upon themselves, where it's like everything in the household is within the brain, yeah. and as men, we're just like, oh yeah, isn't it great? Everything's kind of ticking along. But <laughs> we actually, actually got to take some of that mental <coughs> load off of them to give them the help, give them help, be a helping hand in that regard. And then the before picture here is let me just agree. So that we don't have conflict, <laughs> you know, happy wife, happy life. Right? <coughs> you know, but this, this isn't, this isn't, this can't work this way because that's that, that's that uh, kind of selfish ambition, that vain conceit. It's just like, what, what makes me feel good at the moment? Yeah, yeah, and similar to what I was kind of just saying before, like that being honest with humility is actually the path to like properly connect, so that you can end up like-minded. And so now what we're going to do is something uh, that we like to do at our marriage tonight. It's actually split up into our couples and ask a couple of questions. These are just a couple of, uh, if you guys don't know what to ask one another or about what you guys have, we've talked about, I'm going to leave it up here so you can look at it. But, you know, how does your spouse pre- pre- prefer to communicate when it comes to conflict? You know, what is the way that they like it? Are they, uh, like, in the moment kind of person? Or is it, uh, I need to actually separate a little bit and, you know, go, go have some time by myself or, you know, what is something that your spouse does that makes you feel loved or appreciated? 
You know, some, and, and not just like some things that they're not doing, but what are some things that they do currently that really make you feel loved and appreciated? And then what's something that they, that they could do or something that they used to do that really made you feel loved and, and you'd love for them to start it again? But what we'll do is we'll split up our chairs a little bit and have our own little, go, go to your corners and you know, talk to one another. Uh, it's a bit of a date night kind of thing. So, but we'll go ahead and break up and, uh, and uh, get together. So. <laughs>